Good morning. Our text this week talks about love, the greatest commandment that God has ever given to us. And despite seeking to teach us the ways of life, Jesus asks a question to all of us. Will you remain faithful? Will you love God and will you love neighbor as self? So with that in mind, let us join in our call to worship. With hearts ready to serve, God turns our mourning into singing and our sorrows into laughter. With hope and expectation, God turns our weeping into celebration and our grief into shouts of joy. Let us come before the Lord with yearning and hearts that are ready to serve. Let us pray together. May your love, O God, move all that stands before us. We yearn to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. But often we find such love beyond us. Nurture us in your healing love, that your love may be like springs of living water, that we may rejoice and be glad, for we are your people, and you are our God. Amen. I'd like to thank um, Gary, who's going to be singing in just a moment, and for Alice for their offering of music.
Our scripture text comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 46. Hear now God's word. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment is the law? In the law is the greatest. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And with all your mind, this is the greatest and the first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you have commanded us to love, to love you with all our heart and soul and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Lord, sometimes we don't even know our neighbor, but we ask you, Lord, to equip us with the Holy Spirit So not only that we can love, but we can know. Amen. In Matthew's text, we read that there's a lawyer that tests Jesus by asking him a question. You see, there's a difference between a test and a tempter. The tester hopes that when the person who is being asked the question responds that they will succeed. But the tempter hopes that the person who is responding to the question will fail. The lawyer asks Jesus, which is the greatest commandment? And you know, that's usually not a problem in the Jewish sector to debate what is the greatest because in the Old Testament there are 613 commandments. Rabbis will say this is a heavy or this is a light commandment, meaning this weighs more than the other one, that we should take it more to heart, more serious. They have this debate regarding relative importance with the various commandments. But the biblical love that Jesus is talking about is a way of life. The way we act in relationship to God and to other people. It's more of an action than it is a feeling. By calling us to love our neighbor, Jesus kind of particularizes love. He doesn't say, go out and love everybody because you don't even know them, love the person on the TV because there's a report on the news. He says, I want you to have a name and a face. I want you to know your neighbor so that you can love your neighbor. He calls us to love those that we have contact with in our everyday life. Now, I don't know about you, but as a child, When I was growing up, I knew every neighbor around us. And now that I have moved several times in the ministry, I'm not so sure that I know every neighbor around me. I know my neighbor to the left and to the right, and I know the neighbor across the street, but I have no idea who the neighbor is over the ravine. So it's a little bit harder these days to know our neighbor, especially with COVID. I don't know that we want to know all of our neighbors right now. But to love neighbor means that it is someone 
that has a connection with you. I know all of us have to eat, so we have a connection with either a banker or a grocery teller or someone that helps us to get the things that we need. The homeless person that stands on the street corner I saw down here at Red Bank in Madison the other day, that's our neighbor too. And the person who is just getting out of prison or jail and they are re-entering society, that's our neighbor as well. The person that has mental health issues, they might be in our family, they might be in someone else's family. That person is our neighbor as well. Jesus calls us to love those who have a face, and that face is our neighbor. It might not be pretty, it might be pretty messy, but all the same, we are called to love. I was thinking about what does it mean to love today, right now? We're all wearing masks, not because we're afraid to get COVID. We're wearing masks because we love the person sitting next to us or the person in this very room because we do not want to give someone else a disease, an illness. We follow guidelines and restrictions. And do we like it? No. But we do it out of love, not fear. Let's face it. There are things that are much easier in this life to follow than some of the guidelines that we are given. It's also easier for us to put money in an offering plate for a disaster relief or a family that's in need during the holidays than it is to become friends or neighbors with those very people. We have been commanded to love. So what does that look like? And how do we do that well? Not half-heartedly, but with our whole being. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's kind of like the golden rule, isn't it? It's like, I want somebody to love me the way that I would love them. Now, I know that there's a book out in the five love languages and we all love differently. However, I want you to treat me the way that you would want to be treated. And vice versa, right? Jesus' commandment to love neighbor assumes that we look out for someone other than ourselves, interest. It's the greater good of the whole, right? So what is your definition of love? The Bible speaks specifically in the Greek language of two different kinds of love. Agape and philia, or philio. Agape has been been defined as self-sacrificial love and it's committed to the highest good. It is a love that is not dependent on emotions. And without this kind of love, it would be impossible for us to be reconciled with God. Through agape love, God sent his son to die on a cross for you and I. He bore our sins so that we can be forgiven. Not just ours, but our neighbors too. And philia is best described as brotherly love. Philadelphia is known as the city of brotherly love. It's the love between true friends, a love that can be casual or fairly intense. It's a love that responds to love from someone else. The Bible tells us that the greatest commandment is to love your Lord, your God, with all of your heart, soul, and mind. 
And Jesus said that loving your neighbor was just as important because we are to love with our entire being. Now, it might be easy for you and I to say, I love God, no doubt about it. I love God, I'm here to worship, you know, I I do what I can for other people. But we begin to see that the greatest commandment is connected with the great commission. It becomes simultaneous because the love command is the very foundation of Christianity. And it calls, God calls for each one of us to be an authentic Christian, not to play church and just come on Sunday. Remember I said that it's a biblical love, it's a way of life. It's the way that we do things in our life. Jesus tells us that we must love God with all that we are because being half-hearted is not acceptable. God demands from us an all-consuming love because guess what? That's exactly the way that God loves you and I. Exactly the way. God doesn't love us half-heartedly and he doesn't love us on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. God loves us 24-7 every day every day. So what does it mean to love God with all of our heart? Jesus is talking about intentional motivation that drives us. So what are we to do with this love that becomes a passion for God? Listen to what Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, 21. Where your treasure is, There your heart will be also. What we treasure reflects our passion. And what we have a passion for, we we would consider to be our treasure. Here's the question. Do you and do I treasure God? We know God as a saving God and a friend. But are we passionate about God? A.W. Tozer said it like this, We may want God, but we want something else more, and we get what we want the most. So what do I mean by passion? The passion I'm talking about is defined in Webster's Dictionary as a strong, extravagant fondness, an enthusiasm, and a desire for something. When Jesus commands us to love God with all of our heart, he's telling us to have that same strong, extravagant fondness and enthusiasm and desire. Second Chronicles 15.15 15 says, And all Judea rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all of their heart and sought him with all of their soul. And he was found by them, and the Lord gave them rest all around. Does that sound like passion for God? It is the cry of an authentic Christian Christian and Christianity. What happens when it's hard to find our passion for God? Some of us can't seem to find our passion for God because, let's face it, we just need a heart transplant. Second Chronicles 12, 14 tells us, And he did evil because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. Friends, when we wake up in the morning, God woke you up for a purpose. Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God knows your heart condition and mine. You and I have an interest in God, and we can have a desire for spiritual things. But God tells us that he can give us a new heart. God can give us a new heart. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh 
and give you a heart of flesh. And then I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my commandments and do them. Friends, when we give our lives to Christ in response to God's pull on our heartstrings, we not only get a new spiritual heart, we get a heart that's passionate for God, to know God personally, and to obey God's commandment to love, to love God, to love neighbors, to love ourselves. In Hebrews 10, 16, we read, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their heart and their minds, and I will write them. And then he adds, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. If you've lost your passion for God, it's not too late. We don't have to say that we're passionate when we're not. You can't fake it. Either you are or you're not. James 4 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Don't allow the day to day grind to strip you of your passion for God. God is passionate for you. And God expects you to be passionate for him. So how can we restore that passion for God? How can we obtain spiritual renewal? We can worship out of love and not obligation. When's the last time that you have sung your heart out in worship to God? When's the last time? I have a little witness over here if I probably wanted to ask that question, and she could probably tell you, well, we turn the radio on and sing our hearts out to God. Even a five-year-old can do it. Friends, it's not impossible. We can not only read and study scripture, we can engrave it on our hearts. I don't know about you, but I need it every day. There are days when I don't have my Bible ready to whip out in the middle of Kroger or on the street when somebody's just cut me off. That's when those scriptures that are engraved on my heart speak through my soul and I can speak love to the neighbor that is having a hard day right scripture encourages us and guides us and it even corrects us and what about your prayer life you want to be passionate for God let me just tell you I learned a long time ago that God is up and willing and ready every hour, every minute of the day. He's there for us. So when you pray, pray with all your heart. Share your closest moments with Christ, with your friends and your family. Talk about where God is leading you. And how God is expecting you to lead if you're in a leadership role. In verse 40 in our text today, it says, The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. I want you to think about a door. Can you look at that door and you see the woodwork around it? And can you see the hinges? I want you to... Put that image of those um, door hinges right there in your mind. This door is hanging from a pair of hinges. The door hinges restrict the motion of the door to the arc in which is it intended to swing. And as as long as both hinges remain secure and the frame remains square, the door will function reliably, moving where its creator intended it and closing securely. However, 
How many of you have ever seen the screws start coming out of a hinge? Or something happens where the door's not square? If it comes loose or the door is obstructed, or if it's torn loose from the frame altogether, you see <laughs> there's a loss of function. The loss of either the hinge or the door itself is, is paramount into whether things work properly or not. So obedience to the two commandments to love God and to love neighbor work together. They work together to restrict our activity to a straight and narrow path that God has created for you and I to walk. As long as we observe both commandments, we can be confident that we are on a godly path instead of a worldly path. If we choose to ignore either love, we're going to find ourselves in a spiritual ditch or unhinged, right? Jesus fulfills the law not by emphasizing who people are, but by moving our understanding of the law into a new dimension beyond routine obedience and observance to a place where you and I must bring our whole hearts, our whole selves. It's a task of loving. And I do believe that every human being has this unquenchable desire and longing for love to be loved, because friends, God is love. And Jesus is the embodiment of love. Everything he says and everything he does is motivated by love. God has given humans the desire and capacity to love because we've been created in God's image. There's nothing that you can do to separate you from the love of God, because God loves everyone. God's love has no beginning, and it has no end. We can't measure its height or depth or length. It's an inexhaustible love. Inexhaustible. God's love is spontaneous and transcends all human limits. Throughout Matthew's Gospel, Jesus has demonstrated ministry and trained his disciples and provided the church a mission and a purpose. And he's given them a great love, a great inexhaustible love. I don't know, church. I think it's time for us to love. What about you? Amen.
You have been sent by God's love with hope and with healing. Love God. Love yourself. Love your neighbor. Because God loves you. Amen.